So with, with error control, we need to retransmit. So we need a, a mechanism for uh, detecting when to tra retransmit. And with stop and wait ARQ, it's very similar to stop and wait flow control. Send data, receive the act. Send data, receive the act. Of course, we care about what happens when things go wrong. Say, when we lose data, yesterday we got to the case of, if I bring it up, uh, where? Where was yesterday? Yesterday we covered this case of A transmits data. The first one's successful, everything's okay. And the second one, we lose data. The second data frame transmitted didn't get to B. The way that A knows it doesn't get there is it doesn't get an ACK within time. So it's waiting for an ACK, it's waiting, waiting, no ACK comes back after some predefined time. So we must know what this interval should be. Our timer expires and that triggers a retransmission. The same data frame, data frame 2, is retransmitted and in this case it gets delivered successfully. So this was an example of lost data. Then we move to another case when there's a lost ACK. Same initial case, data, the first piece of data is delivered. B gets the first piece of data. The second one is transmitted, gets delivered. B gets the second piece. The ACK comes back, but something goes wrong. Any questions on stop and wait ARQ? The ACK comes back, but doesn't get to A. Something goes wrong with a link. There's an error. So that, again, from A's perspective, we're waiting for the act, waiting for the act. Act doesn't come within our time timeout period, so that triggers a retransmission of data two. And the problem that we get is that when that data two arrives at B, the question we raised yesterday is what do we do with it? What should B do with that data? And the right response is we should ignore it. Because if, if B accepts this data, it gets the data, the message in there, and it uses it in some way, then that would be wrong because it's the same data, it's just a retransmission of the previous one. So we need some way for B to, to realize, ah, this piece of data I just received is in fact a retransmission of the previous one, and therefore I should re ignore the second case. If we didn't ignore it, then depending upon what the application was that was transferring the data, but things will go wrong. The example I used yesterday, if the data was saying transfer 10,000 baht to Steve's account, the bank receives it here, transfers 10,000 baht into my account, but then receives a copy of that same message again. And the bank doesn't know, is this, is this a second amount of 10,000 baht that should be transferred, or is this just a copy of the first one? So it gets confused. So we must have some way to detect that this data is a retransmission of this one. Then we can ignore it. We still send the ACK. So B receives the data, realizes, ah, this is a retransmission. Maybe A didn't receive the ACK, so they retransmitted. So let's send them the ACK again, and let's hope it gets through. So we still send the ACK. How does B know to ignore this one? How does B know to ignore this data message? What is B going to do to, to realize that this is the retransmission of the previous one?
we can't just check the data. That's, the data is a sequence of bits. It could be that the sequence of bits we receive is identical to the previous one. That could, be, could have been intentional. We don't know. Okay, so we need some other way for B to know that this is a retransmission. What, are we, what can we do? How can B know that this data message is the same as the previous one? Sequence numbers. Give each data message a sequence number so a retransmission will have the same sequence number as before and in that way B will know, ah, this is a retransmission. So in fact, if you recall back to stop and wait flow control, there were no sequence numbers. We only introduced sequence numbers with sliding window. But in fact, with stop and wait ARQ, we actually need sequence numbers. And I'll start to draw them. And with stop and wait, we only need a one bit sequence number. 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. So the first one, let's say this is sequence number 0. Even though it was the first piece of data, the sequence number we gave it was 0. That was included in the frame. When B sends the act back, what acknowledgement number does it include? This is a sequence number. The sequence number is what we call the number we include with the data. And when we send an act back, we include an acknowledgement number. The act number. I'm running out of space. So each frame now includes a number inside the header. Remember, the act says, what's the next number I expect? B received data with sequence number 0, therefore sends an act saying, I now expect data with sequence number 1. A receives that act, sends the next piece of data, which of course has sequence number 1. B receives data with sequence number 1, sends an act with act number... What's the act number here? Zero. The number after one is zero when we use just one bit. With one bit, it goes zero, one, zero, one, so on. So the next one expected is zero. It doesn't get to B, though. Oh, sorry, it doesn't get to A. So after a timeout, A retransmits the previous one, so it's the same sequence number. It's still sequence number one. Now when B receives this data frame with sequence number 1, it realizes this is not in order. B received data with sequence number 0, the first one, and then receives sequence number 1. B is expecting sequence number 0. That's what it said in the act. I expect to get 0. If I receive 1, then I know that that's not correct. And that's how B knows to ignore this data. B is expecting sequence number 0, but it gets 1, so it ignores that, but still sends back an ACK, and what ACK number? What is B expecting? What did B just receive? Look at the sequence numbers, the purple ones. B received sequence number 1, it's expecting 0. It receives sequence number 1 again, it ignores that, realizing this is out of sequence. It should be 0, 1, 0, 1. Here it's 1, 1. Ignore this one and still tell A, I'm still waiting for 0. I'm still waiting for data with sequence number 0. So the next piece of data, when A receives that, A realizes, okay, my data with sequence number one was successfully delivered. I can move on. 
zero means that one was delivered. The previous number to zero is one. So now the next data we send The next one we send, the third frame, the third piece of data, has sequence number. What sequence number? 50% chance of being correct. Zero. When we send back an act saying, I expect to receive zero, then of course, if everything's okay, the next one we'll send is zero. Assuming it's okay, it gets delivered. Data gets delivered, eventually ACT comes back. ACT number? Data zero received, say thank you, I now expect data with sequence number one. So the act number is one in that case. And in, on, upon reception of this data frame, the third data frame, B receives and processes that data. So we haven't shown the processing time, but data three has been su successfully delivered here. So we do have sequence numbers in stop and wait ARQ and you'll go back and you'll fix the example from yesterday and add sequence numbers. So I didn't draw them yesterday but the reason we need them is because of this case, the lost ACK. Just see what happened. Sequence number. Actually, we'll go back to the, the original case first. Then we'll go through that one. Here in this diagram, I included the sequence numbers. In the normal case, you'll see data sequence number 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. Just keep going like that if everything's OK. And the ACK, 1, 0, 1, 0, and so on. So that's the normal case. In the case of a lost ACK, the same. 0, data 1. But when we retransmit, of course, we don't change the sequence number. Original data, retransmission of that previous one. And we know that by the, the same sequence number. And that's how B knows to ignore that data frame. Any questions on stop and wait ARQ? And the example, look at the example we, you drew, drew yesterday. Yeah. Does it always begin with zero? The sequence number, no, not necessarily. It not, must start somewhere, a sequence number. It makes sense to start at zero. Okay? But in theory, it could start at one. But it would be agreed upon by the, the actual devices which are using this protocol. So. Uh, similar with sliding window in the previous topic. Remember we had sequence numbers say 0 to 3 or 0 to 7. It's natural to think that they'll start at 0. But in practice, they don't have to. We can start anywhere in that range. And in fact, in practice, in some protocols, they don't start at 0. But in, in the examples that I use, I usually start at 0 because when we start counting, we start there, when we use binary at least. When the ACK is... Re the, the sequence numbers, of course, we increment for each new data frame. Okay, we start... The first data frame is zero. So just think of the sequence number we're incrementing. First data frame is zero. Next one is one. The next one is... Well, we don't have two. 
with just one bit. So we just got a one bit sequence number. So the next one, instead of two, we go back to zero. We wrap around to zero. And then we go back to one, increment to one, increment, ah, we don't have two, so back to zero. So it's really just alternating. And the ACK is just saying, okay, B receive data with sequence number zero, send back an ACK saying, I expect in the next data delivery, sequence number one. So the ACK number is what's expected. Does that address the, uh, your question? So this is like the sequence numbers in sliding window, but just one bit. Sometimes this is called an alternating bit protocol. That is the, the, the data frames that just alternate, 0, 1, 0, 1. Maybe just go back to the one from yesterday where I didn't draw sequence numbers, but we can add them just for completeness. Same as before, sequence number, let's, sorry, uh, sequence number zero, act number one, next data, sequence number one, data was lost, Next data, what's the sequence number here? One, because it's a retransmission of the previous one. When B receives data one, it sends back act number zero. Next one I expect is zero, and so on. But we need sequence numbers to keep track, and especially if there's a lost act, for B to know that there is a, a retransmission. Any questions on stop and wait? That's the basic, the stop, stop and wait ARQ. ARQ means automatic repeat request. It's the general name for these mechanism, mechanisms for retransmissions. We automatically uh, repeat the data transmissions when we detect a loss. In this case, we detect a loss from a timeout. A few, a few issues which is related to this and, and the next protocol and, and in fact in general to these types of uh, data link protocols. One is uh, the timer. So the way it works is after A sends the data it starts its timer and once it reaches some value we say the timer expires or a timeout occurs and that triggers a retransmission. What value should this be? How long should we wait for the act to come back? So that, that's a parameter that we need to have. What is this period here? What do you think it should be? How long should A wait for the acknowledgement to come back? Any ideas? Compared with the previous round, you mean what happened in the previous successful transfer? Yes. Okay, and how would you compare, compared to what value? Uh, 400. Propagation for the data to get to B, plus, plus the act to be transmitted and get yeah. back, okay. So that's, we should wait long enough to give be a chance to get the act back to us. Okay, So we send data. In the normal case, we know there's going to be some propagation delay, some processing possibly at B, some act transmission delay, plus some propagation back. So A knows there's going to be some delay before I get the act. So I need to wait long enough to give a chance for that act to get back. So the timeout interval must be large enough such that we can get an act back in the normal case if there was nothing lost. How long should that be? How would you calculate that? Uh, 
if you're computer A, how do you calculate that time? Round what? You cor but how, what do you need to know to calculate that? Let's say it's your phone. Your phone is communicating to the, the, white, the, the base station using uh, some mobile technology. There's a link. You need to, when you transmit data, you need to know how long it takes for the act to get back. What does it depend upon? Well, propagation delay depends upon the distance. Does your phone know how far away you are from the base station? Not very accurately. Okay, you may be able to estimate, but generally not. Sometimes we don't know what the propagation delay will be. Now it might be uh, one microsecond, tomorrow it may be 10 microseconds. So in different situations, the propagation delay may not be known in advance. That's a bit of a problem. In this example, I didn't draw the processing delay, but in, there is a processing delay from when it's received until when the act comes back. How long does it take a computer to process a frame? Estimates? Anyone? How long does it take a computer to process, say, a thousand byte data frame? Is it the same for every computer in the world? No. The processing delay, if my, my laptop is computer B, it may be very short. If your phone is computer B, it may be very long. And A doesn't know that. Okay, so we cannot easily predict what the processing delay will be. So in fact, it's quite hard in some cases for A to know how long it takes to get the act back. So usually we need to estimate what the maximum time would be. So under the worst conditions, and set the time out interval to be larger or slightly larger than that. We need to give some time for the B to process and send the act back. So let's say the propagation delay was 100 milliseconds, the transmission was of the act was 10, and the propagation back was 100. What should the time out be? 100 there, 10 to transmit, 100 back. How long should I wait? At least? Two propagations plus the ACK. So at least 210 in that example. Larger, because sometimes it, maybe there's a processing delay which we cannot predict. So usually we make it slightly larger. Why not? Okay, instead of 210, why not make it 1,000 or 1 million milliseconds? I, I expect the propagation to be 100. Maybe the act transmission changes. Why not make the timeout interval very, very long? What's the problem? Let's say it takes about 210 milliseconds, normal case, to get the act back. But I wait for, say, a thousand milliseconds before I retransmit. What's the problem with that? Why not have a large timeout interval? Look at our efficiency when there is a, a loss. In this case, send data. All this time when I'm waiting for my timer to expire, I'm being inefficient. I'm not doing anything. I'm not transferring data. The longer I wait before I resend, the lower the efficiency. So if there's a loss, I really want the timeout to be as short as possible. So that, okay, there's a loss, timer expires, let's resend again and hopefully it gets there the second time. So we want the timer or the timeout interval to be short in the case there's a loss, so we are efficient, but we want it to be long enough such that in the case that there's no loss, we get a chance for the act to come back. So we, we need to consider a trade-off. Large enough to get the act back, small enough so that our efficiency is not too low. We don't wait for too long. So generally we try and, if we can estimate how long it takes to get an act back, 
we set it slightly larger than that. There's no easy way to calculate in some cases. Maybe we can try and draw those, those cases. Uh, roughly draw what happens. Let's say we have a case we'll consider two cases. One when it's we send the, the data, we set the timeout to be too small. Normally it takes some time to propagate. The act comes back and it's going to propagate back. The act will arrive here. But if I start my timer at this time, and if I set it too small and it expires here, what happens? I'll resend. When I didn't really have to, I resend. But if I waited a little bit longer, I would have got the act back and I wouldn't have needed to resend. So this is the problem of if you set the timeout interval to be too small, you'll retransmit when you don't need to. That's a waste. And the other case, if we set it to be too large, we send our data. We s in the case that that data is lost, we'd normally expect it to come back. Let's say we set the timeout to be very long. then it times out and we retransmit. In this case, with a very long timeout, we spend a lot of time waiting before we resend, and that's very inefficient. We want to spend as much time as possible transmitting data. In this case, a long timeout can lead to lower efficiency. So ideally, we'd like the timeout to be a little bit larger than, or at least, the time it takes to get the act back. In practice, we usually give it a little bit of freedom and la make it a bit larger so that if there's some variation, we'll, we'll uh, take that into account. But it should be at least the time for the data to propagate, the act to be transmitted and to propagate back. Not too small, not too large. Any questions about the timeout interval? <clears throat> in some systems and in some protocols, it's defined in advance. That is, the value is given. In others, the, the software try and estimates the best value over time. So it measures how long it takes the previous one and then adapts the, the timeout interval to take that into account. We will not go, go into those protocols. That's on one of the slides here, I think. How long should the timeout interval be? What's another thing that we skipped over? Uh, how related to both sliding window stop and wait flow control and, and the ARQ protocols, how big should our data frame be? Another design issue. In these examples we didn't say, but in previous examples we gave an example, or we gave a value of, I think we calculated 8,000, or 1,000 bytes was the data frame plus 20 byte of header. How big should our data frame be? in general. If we go back if you go back maybe you have, a, I don't have the picture, but when we calculated even for stop and wait we said we had a thousand byte messages. A data frame contained a thousand bytes plus twenty bytes of header. 
and we calculated the efficiency. And we said what about the data frame? Should we bake it smaller or larger for higher efficiency? With the data frame, regard to efficiency, should we make the data frame or the, the amount of data larger or smaller? If you go back to your notes, you should see that we said larger data frame leads to higher efficiency. It doesn't matter if you're on this slide, but around here we did some examples and one of the cases was, okay, when it's a thousand bytes, we got an efficiency of about 96%. Then we reduced the data frame from a thousand bytes down to 100 bytes. We made it smaller and our efficiency went down. And the trend we said was higher efficiency is achieved when we have a larger data frame. So, and that applies with the others as well. Larger data frame can lead to higher efficiency. So, why not make the data frame a million bytes? We said a larger data frame gives us a larger efficiency. Why not make it a million or 10 million or a gigabyte? Higher waiting time. Who? The efficiency will be higher in the normal case. That is, if we have a larger frame, we'll get a higher efficiency with stop and wait. What are some problems with a large data frame? If you think of stop and wait ARQ, the problem with a large data frame is that we need to resend a lot if there's an error. If we have, if we lose a frame, if we transmit a frame and it's lost, then we lose a lot all at once. And we need to retransmit a lot. But if we have a smaller frame and we lose just one frame, we only lose a small amount of data and only need to retransmit a small amount of data. I'll show you a slide that mentions that, but try and draw that. Uh, let's say we have a data frame. We've got two options, one large data frame or maybe several smaller data frames. So we consider two cases. A case one where we have one big data frame and case two where we have four small data frames. Same amount of data in total. Okay, we're still sending the same number of bits, but we have different size frames containing those bits. Let's say that when we transmit that, that there's a small error, a single bit error in the transmission. And that occurs randomly. So at some point in time, maybe this is a bit different from our other diagrams, but think of time going in this way. That is, I start transmitting the frame. So I've drawn a, on a different axis here. I start transmitting the frame and I finish transmitting here. And if I use four frames, I start transmitting here and finish transmitting here. I'm not going to show it going from A to B, just look at the frames. And let's say that there's one bit error randomly in that time and I'll choose a random time point. Let's say uh, randomly we choose a time and it's here. What I'm trying to show is that we transmit all our bits 
And at some point in time, there's an error on the link. And just one of those bits sent is in error. And it's the bit at this point in time, this red line. When B receives, look at the top, top case. When B receives this data frame, what does it do? It ignores it or discards it because this data frame, the top one, has an error in it. And we said if there's an error, there's an error detected, we discard that frame and eventually A will retransmit. So in the top case, we essentially lose the entire frame due to one bit. And what we retransmit, eventually, sometime later, what will be retransmitted? Well, that entire frame. Sometime later, A will retransmit that frame because it had an error in it. Now, in the second case, A transmitted four frames. There was one bit error. What does B do when it receives these four frames? And to make it a bit easier, let's put numbers in them. B receives these four frames. Frame number two has an error in it. So we'll discard frame number two. And eventually, that will need to be retransmitted. It depends upon the scheme. We'll see some other schemes later. But if we don't receive this piece of data, it will need to be retransmitted at some time later. So of those four frames, one of them, the one that contains the error, will need to be resent. What I'm trying to show is that with smaller frames, in the case of errors, smaller frames lead to less retransmissions, which is better. Okay, the second case is better because we only have to resend a little amount of data. In the first case, we need to resend everything. So in the case of errors, smaller frames are better. In the case of no errors, we've said larger frames are better because they can give us higher efficiency. Also, larger frames are better because the header is a less proportion of the total frame, a large amount of data. Another factor. Uh, regarding frame size, let's say our receiver buffer The amount of memory at the receiver is 4,500 bytes. That's the size of the buffer at the receiver. Let's see, given different frame sizes, how much of that buffer space we can utilize. What if we transmit frames which are always 4,000 bytes in length? How many frames can we fit in our buffer at the receiver? One. Okay. We can't split them in, 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 into smaller chunks. So if we transmit a 4,000 byte frame, our buffer contains 4,500 bytes. So we can fit at the receiver one frame. And we effectively waste 500 bytes because we use up 4,000 of that buffer and the other 500 bytes we've got nothing in there. What if we used a different size frame? What if we used a 3,000 byte frame? How many can we fit in the buffer? Only one at a time. 
and we still waste, in this case, even more. That is, we've got 4,500 bytes of memory, but we only use 3,000 bytes at a time. It's no use having that extra 1,500 bytes. Let's try a smaller size frame. Transmit frames of 2,000 bytes each. How many can we fit in the receiver buffer? We can fit two at a time. Wasting just 500 bytes. So that's better than the first and second case. We don't waste as much as the second case, the same as the first, but we can fit two frames. Same amount of data though, 4,000 bytes in total. Try a smaller frame. Four frames we can fit in, but we still waste some space in the buffer. So there's no use having 4,500 bytes if we never use that 500 bytes there. Try 500 bytes. How many can we fit in the buffer? Nine frames. How much do we waste? That's the best case. That is, if we have smaller frames for, the, for a given size buffer, in general, we'll be able to utilize that buffer in a better manner. We'll waste less space. It's the idea of you've got a box, and then the, the smaller the objects you put in there, the, the more efficiently you can utilize that storage space, that box. So smaller frames are better with respect to using that buffer space that we have available. And the previous case, smaller frames are better in the case of errors, less to retransmit. But in the case of no errors, larger frames are better because we have higher efficiency, less overhead, more time transmitting. Somewhere there's a slide that says that. Here, what size frames to use? In practice, the, the technologies usually uh, impose a limit on the, the frame size. If you're using Wi-Fi, wireless LAN, there's a limit of the frame size, I think 1,500 bytes. Or, or a LAN, 1,500 bytes plus some header. Why do they have limits? What are the good values of the frame size? Well, larger fra frames, less overheads due to header. The more data in there, the, the smaller the header is compared to the, the total size. Smaller frames can utilize the buffer space better, like we just saw. If we have to retransmit, smaller frames are better, less to retransmit. There are a few other reasons we will not cover this one, this third one yet. Uh, efficient sharing. So there's a trade-off. There's no optimal or best frame size. You need to consider these different factors. Large frame size and, and small frames, you, we can usually uh, compare under different conditions to see which one is best for a particular scenario. But there's no one best value. So there are two issues which are relevant for all of these protocols, uh, flow control and error control. What's the frame size and what's the timeout interval? What's a good timeout interval? Any questions on those two issues, general design issues? So thus, some of those reasons are why when you say download a large file on, to your, across the internet, that the file is not sent all at once, it's sent in chunks, in frames, or, or in general packets, send part at a time. We've got two more to go through, but they're quite similar to what we've seen already. Let's go back to stop and wait. 
So with error control, there are three, three general approaches. Stop and wait ARQ, we've gone through. Then the next two, go back N and selective reject, they are similar to sliding window. Stop and wait, send one frame, get an act back. Sliding window, send a window of frames, get an act back, or get multiple acts back. These two are based on sliding window, and just small differences between them. Go back in. Let's use the example. It, it comes up a bit small there. Uh, I have it bigger somewhere. Here it is. This is go back N. And the, the slide or the picture in the slide is slightly different from what we've been drawing. It we try to simplify instead of drawing the rectangles for the frames, it's just showing the the timing of the exchange of those frames. Remember with sliding window we can send multiple frames before we have to wait for an ACK. Okay, it's not data ACK, data ACK. Here we have multiple data frames, so frame where it says frame, it's a data frame. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and it sends multiple. And then acts, in this case, they're called receive ready. B is saying I'm ready to receive more at different times. So this is the normal case. Sending data frames, getting acts back. We want to consider what happens when something goes wrong. Maybe we can write on there what's, what's being received by B. B has received frame 0, 0 and 1. At this time it's received 0, 1 and 2. Then it receives frame 3, so 0, 1, 2, 3. Then from B's perspective, a little bit later, it receives frame 5. That's a problem. B has received 0, 1, 2, and 3. We expect to receive frames in order. We get 0, 1, 2, and 3, and then uh, we're waiting. We receive frame 5, frame with sequence number 5. That indicates something's gone wrong at B. Because if A is sending them in order, I should have received 4 next, but I get 5. So that tells B there's been an error. And in this go back N protocol, what it does, it sends back a special ACK message saying, there's been an error. I'm waiting for frame number four. It's called a reject message. The, the name's not so important, but think of it as an act saying, I'm still expecting frame number four. I've got zero, one, two, and three. I must receive them in order. Don't send them to me out of order. If they're errors, then you must retransmit. So, and what go back end does is when B receives frame five, because it's out of order, it discards it, throws it away. And similar, a little bit later, B receives frame 6, also out of order, discards that frame. Why did it receive them? Because with the window in this example, A was allowed to send frame 0 through to 6. The window was 7, so it was allowed to send them, but one of them was lost. Frame 4 we see was lost. A didn't know that but B detected something went wrong because it received 5 before it got 4. So it sends back an act saying, I'm waiting for frame 4, and it discards any subsequent frames, 5 and 6 in this case. So when this 
reject message comes back to A, it realizes, ah, something's gone wrong. I have sent frames 0 through to 6, but B is expecting frame 4. Therefore, I must go back and retransmit frame 4 and 5 and 6. I go back and retransmit n frames, where n is the number of frames since and including the one that was rejected. So we see what happens. B is expecting 4. That triggers A to retransmit frame 4, 5, and 6. 4 because that's what B is looking for. That's what it's uh, expecting. 5 and 6 because A knows since sending frame 4, I've also sent 5 and 6. Therefore, we'll retransmit those three frames. Let's go back N. When we have a sliding window, we keep track of the frames and if we, in this case, B detects a loss, because it receives out of order, the source, A, will need to go back and retransmit multiple frames. In this case, 5 and 6, as well as the lost one. Why? Well, because it keeps it simple for the receiver. Even though it did receive 5 and 6 OK, it just ignores them. I must get them in order. And it doesn't need to buffer these two. So it only stores the ones that it's received in order. It discards 5 and 6. The problem being is that A will need to retransmit 5 and 6. So it makes it easy for the receiver but it's a little bit of a waste in that we need to send 5 and 6 even though they were successfully received. A variation of that is selective reject. Uh, we'll drop back to go back in in a moment, but let's just see the variation. B receives frame 0, has 0 and 1, 0, 1 and 2, then it receives 3, everything's okay. It's waiting, it's waiting. So this is selective reject, the next protocol. 4 is not received, it was lost. It receives 5. So what B does, again it detects an error. I last received 3, I received 5, 4 is missing. So it will send back a special act saying, effectively, please retransmit 4. It's a reject message or a selective reject. I reject or I expect to receive frame 4. But what's different from go back in is that we have 0, 1, 2, 3. We're missing 4, but we also have 5. We buffer 5 as well. So we do store frames out of order with selective reject. It's a little bit more complex for the receiver because it must have some buffer space for this frame and, and keep track of the ones which are missing. It sounds simple, but in some implementations that uh, adds, adds too much complexity. And when it receives 6, it's got 0, 1, 2, 3. It's still missing 4, 5, and 6. When A receives that selective reject message, it knows, ah, I'll need to retransmit frame 4. So I'll retransmit frame 4, but not 5 or 6. So this is where it differs from go back n. We only retransmit the one that was rejected. And when frame 4 is received, then we have all of the frames in order. What is B expecting next? 
the next number is 7. So it sends back a receive ready or an ACK saying I now expect 7. So selective reject is more efficient in that we don't retransmit so much but a little bit more complex at the receiver in that we need to buffer those frames received out of order and keep track of them. So that's the, the real difference between these two, go back N and selective reject. I'll go back to go back in and then we'll see a couple of other points. Do we have it? Go back in. At this point we have just 0, 1, 2 and 3. We've discarded frame 5. When we receive 6 we don't do anything, just discard it. So we just have 0, 1, 2 and 3. When A receives the reject message, it realizes it needs to retransmit four as well as subsequent frames it's already sent, five and six. And it uh, will receive four, send receive ready for waiting for five. Then we eventually receive five. and then 6. And send a receive ready saying I'm waiting for, or an ACK saying I'm waiting for frame number 7. So that's the same point as selective reject. Go back N, more retransmissions but simpler. Selective reject, only retransmit the loss message but more complex. In this case, when we have the window, the receiver can detect an error. See, by receiving frames out of order, B knows there's been an error and can send this special act back saying, really, there's been an error, this reject message. On this example, the the response messages are called reject messages, receive ready messages. And in selective reject, there's also a selective reject message. But in general, they're all acknowledgements. They're all just acts coming back, using different act numbers, and having different meanings. This example considers what if the ACK is lost as well? Similar to stop and wait, we have a timeout. If we don't receive an ACK within time, we, in, we realize something's gone wrong. So in this case, A has transmitted 5, 6, 7. After transmitting each frame, it sets a timer. If it doesn't receive the ACK in time, that'll trigger a timeout and trigger it to, in this case, slightly different, send a special message to B saying, what have you received? A receive request. And then it sends back an ACK. So if we lose an ACK, instead of retransmitting data, we send a special, special message to B saying, please send me an ACK again. That's what the meaning. And it sends the ACK again. And once we get the ACK, then we know at what number we're up to. We see that, okay, ACK with sequence number 7 was lost. We timed out and that triggered this special message to be sent. Don't worry too much of detail about the p-bit. This is just a message saying, please send me an ACK. Let's see what, just finish this example, what has been received. 0 up until 7 has been received. 0 up until 7 and then the next 0 has been received at this point, the data frame. A hasn't received an act for some time so it times out. 
It asks B, please send me an ACK again, which is this one, saying, what are you expecting? And B is expecting frame with sequence number one. Therefore, the next frame sent is sequence number one. And then we receive the frames received all the way through to two. And it would keep going. The main thing I want you to pick up from go back in is, and, and also selective reject, is how they detect that they've lost a packet at the receiver and what is retransmitted. So this is the part I want you to understand. The lost ACK is not so common, but lost data and the difference between go back in and selective reject is important to know. Lose the data triggers a special act saying, please send again. Send four, five, and six again. In selective reject, lose the data. In selective reject, we lose the data. Please send, this is B telling A, please send frame four again. And frames five and six are buffered. Once we receive frame four, we've got everything back in order and we can move on to frame seven. And so on. That's the main points of these two and the differences. The, the lost act, not so important because it's not so common. Any questions on go back N and selective reject? Just understand that they use a sliding window and they have retransmissions in different manners. Any questions? Where do we get to in our slides? These describe how go back end works. Uh, also about this special act that comes is when we lose an act. Again, just understand the difference between go back end and selective reject. That's the main point there. The details are not so important there. Selective reject minimizes retransmissions compared to go back in, but the destination ne needs a larger buffer and it's more complex at the destination, so that's bad. Turns out because of that extra complexity, go back in is more widely used in, in especially simpler devices. One thing that we've missed and it comes up in these slides. And we've seen it before, we haven't explained it. What is the maximum window size that we have available? There you go, just remember that. In sliding window, including go back n, 2 to the power of k minus 1, where k is the number of bits in the sequence number. I think it's on a slide somewhere, but if we have a k-bit sequence number, we're almost finished. Just to summarize.
when we've got a, a k-bit sequence number, what's the maximum window size that we should use? Remember in the sliding window we used an example of, I think, seven, the window size was 7. We had sequence numbers from 0 through to 7. There's a 3-bit sequence number, the maximum window size was 7. Well, the general rule is that with sliding window and with go back n, sliding window flow control, go back n error control, the same mechanism, the maximum window size is 2 to the power of k all minus 1. So if k is 3, it becomes 7. If k is 4, it becomes 15. So that's the maximum window size. You can have smaller, but generally we set it to the maximum. With selective reject, it's slightly different. It's 2 to the power of, and the exponent is all k minus 1. It's slightly different. So if k is 3, with selective reject, what's the maximum window size? If k is 3, then selective reject, we should have a maximum window size of 4, 2 to the power of 2. If k is 4, then the maximum window size is 8 for selective reject. It's smaller than the other two cases. It's due to the way that the retransmissions and we keep track of the sequence numbers. If we set it larger than these maximum values, we'll get some other problems with the protocols. It's nice to study them, but we do not have time to explain why it's those cases. Go back n and sliding window, 2 to the power of k minus 1. Selective reject, 2 to the power of all k minus 1. We've done timeouts. Where are they used? You can have a look. Many, many protocols in many different networks and links make use of these concepts. Wireless LANs, LANs, uh, dedicated links, say from your home ADSL router to your ISP, um, older links between devices. And in fact, the concepts of these protocols are used in the internet every day. When you download a file, you send an email, you use TCP as a protocol, and TCP uses these mechanisms. We'll mention that protocol towards the end of the course, but flow control and error control are widely used in the internet and in communication systems. That ends this topic, and next week we'll move on to the next topic of multiplexing.